when when someone feels pain, uh, we immediately want to withdraw because that's a very uh, adaptive uh, thing for our brains and our bodies to do. You don't want to uh, run on a broken leg, although many people do, uh, and then they, they pay for the consequences. Um, but when that pain um, becomes chronic, and that's usually six months or longer um, after the normal point of healing, um, our, be- our behaviors begin to change. Welcome to the Exercise is Health podcast, where we're talking about exercise, health, and the interconnectedness of the two. We are your hosts, Charlie and Julie, and we will be coming to you every single week from our studio, Muscle Activation Schaumburg. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Exercise is Health podcast. We are your hosts, Charlie and Julie, and we are coming to you from our studio, Muscle Activation Schaumburg in Schaumburg, Illinois. Now, at Muscle Activation Schaumburg, we believe your health is your most valuable asset. Your health is one of the biggest influencers of the quality and quantity of time that you have. And while there are many aspects of health, our expertise is exercise. Exercise has been proven time and again to not only improve your health, but also increase your longevity and improve your quality of life. But we know that exercise is not the only piece of the puzzle, and that is why we are bringing you a rock star guest today, none other than Dr. Konstantinos Kostas. Dr. Kostas is a health psychologist who is available to assist patients and their families in coping with the emotional, cognitive, and behavioral aspects of medical conditions and surgery. He specializes in helping patients cope with the psychological difficulties of chronic pain, which is exactly what we will be discussing with him today. Dr. Costas, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me, guys. Absolutely. So, Dr. Costas, talk to us about your area of expertise, your background, because, look, our listeners are really excited to hear what you have to say. So, tell them a little bit like, about yourself and what we're going to be talking about today. Sure. So uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I received my PhD in clinical psychology uh, from the Feinberg School of uh, Medicine at Northwestern University. Um, And I did a fellowship uh, in general psychology and rehabilitation, which is really health psychology um, at Rush University Medical Center. Um, I have served as medical director of health psychology at Amita Alexian Brothers Neurosciences Institute since January uh, 2010 and currently provide services to patients and families uh, throughout the Amita Health System. Um, I've had 24 years of experience in the psychological treatment of acute and chronic pain, neurologic conditions, chronic and terminal illness, and depression and anxiety. Um, I've also collaborated on the development of a program designed uh, for those in acute and chronic pain. Uh, This program involves the evaluation of patients in pain, like the spinal cord stimulator evaluations, uh, opioid risk assessment, Um, I also uh, provide outpatient psychotherapy for the treatment of their pain. We also developed the uh, Pain Rehabilitation Outpatient Camp, or ProCamp, which is a six-week multidisciplinary program uh, for patients in chronic pain. That's awesome. So talk to us. Wow, I mean, that's so much cool stuff that that you helped to develop. Talk to us about those different programs, the the outpatient camp, the the spinal stimulator. What what do all those things involve, and what does using them kind of look like? So uh, specifically uh, about our our pain program, uh, when any of our pain program uh, patients come to our anesthesiologist, um, they almost automatically get referred to my service, and I have uh, two colleagues that I work with, um, just to balance out their care. You know, the treatment of pain is not just about uh, the treatment of the physiologic experience of the pain, uh, but it's about the holistic treatment of the pain. So they'll come to us. Uh, where we will assess them. If it's for the spinal cord stimulator specifically, uh, we will do an evaluation uh, to make sure they're a good candidate that they're optimized uh, for that treatment. Um, If they are coming for an opioid risk assessment um, or just to see how they're doing and coping with their pain, uh, we'll meet with them and perhaps provide ongoing psychotherapy uh, for the treatment of their pain. That's really cool. So people come to you because they're in pain, um, because they have had an injury or some kind of uh, chronic pain going on with their life. So it's a it's a physical pain that, that they're feeling. That that's why people come in and seek out your services. Absolutely. And, and again, the, the physicians that we have uh, here at Amita really appreciate that pain is multimodal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, 
the, the passion that I have for, for my work with chronic pain patients um, is certainly fueled uh, by the very real need we have because of the opioid crisis. Uh, but much of it stems uh, from my desire to offer these services to patients, uh, specifically pain patients, uh, who may not have had access uh, to multidisciplinary modalities for the treatment of their pain. Um, 85% um, of chronic pain patients experience some degree of depression. And that number is staggering. And if you don't address that, um, then you're really doing them a disservice. Yeah. You said when people come in, you know, if they're having chronic pain or having an issue and they're going to see, I think you said an anesthesiologist for it, they kind of, they get referred to you as well for the, the kind of the whole picture view. Um, what's that like for patients? Do a lot of patients acknowledge that, hey, maybe I should go see a, you know, a health psychologist? Or do a lot of patients feel like, wait, I'm just having physical pain. Like, just get rid of the physical pain. I'll just be better. Is that a big place of, of an issue, or is that usually well-received? What's that like? Um, it you know, really depends on the, on the patient. You know, mm-hmm. we live in a society where you know, we watch TV and we see a commercial. You take this pill, you should, you know, you should feel better. Um, and thankfully, I think we're moving away from that, um, where many patients, uh, really because of the education that our physicians provide them, understand that they're not being referred to me because their doctors think they're crazy, uh, but right. because they appreciate the pain affects more than their body. Okay. Um, we still have a lot of patients who, when they first come into my office, are a little resistant um, and may actually feel afraid or defensive about talking about the impact that their pain has had on their lives. but. Uh, for the most part, once they begin to talk and realize that this is a service to help them, um, they they tend to respond pretty favorably. That's awesome. And I know that you work with people with chronic pain, but you've also shared that it's it's a plethora of different medical conditions that you seem to help individuals work with. How did you become initially interested in this kind of work rather than, um, you know, a different type of work or like a children's therapist or, you know, whatever uh, all the other categories of psychology there are? Well, I, I initially entered, uh, my, my undergraduate degree was in telecommunications and film. Um, <laughs> and I really was interested more in the, the underpinnings of um, the human dynamic. Um, and once I got into uh, my undergrad, I realized that it was more broadcast media. And I was taking some psychology courses at the same time. And I realized, oh, this is what I really want to study. Hmm. Um, and I just had the opportunity to, to begin working with some medical patients, um, undergrad, and then once I came to Northwestern, um, I was fortunate enough to enter into their health psychology program. Um, and it's, it's really, it's been fascinating for me because understanding the, the mind-body relationship, um, we're in our infancy, I think, of truly understanding that. Um, but when you look at the, some of the more recent research um, that demonstrates even with pain and depression, the overlap in our brains between those two gives rise to treatments um, that are not necessarily um, medication or medically based um, and, and it's exciting to be able to provide that most of our, our treatments um, are evidence-based uh, and they're founded on research uh, that shows that by providing patients with the opportunity to talk about their fears identify whatever struggles they might be having with their medical conditions um, and really understand um, their relationship to their illness um, can help them uh, develop more informed choices uh, and communicate more effectively with their treatment providers. So, Dr. Kostas, you brought up something super interesting, uh, which was this idea that depression and pain have this overlap within the brain. Can you expand on that idea? What did you mean by that exactly? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, let me start by talking about uh, the vicious cycle of pain, right? So, sure. when, when someone feels pain, uh, we immediately want to withdraw because that's a very uh, adaptive uh, thing for our brains and our bodies to do. You don't want to uh, run on a broken leg, although many people do, uh, mm-hmm. and then they, they pay for the consequences. Um, but when that pain um, becomes chronic, and that's usually six months or longer um, after the normal point of healing, um, our, be- our behaviors begin to change. You know, We begin to withdraw. Um, that withdrawal leads to um, disability, uh, it can lead to muscle atrophy, mm. um, and then when we begin to use those muscles, we begin to um, hurt even more, mm. and that triggers for us, of course, the natural response is to withdraw even more, and then we begin to withdraw from friends and families, um, and then many of us begin to develop a level of depression and anxiety, mm. uh, which then makes us 
stay away even more. And then we enter um, the sphere response where we are beginning to emotionally suffer. Um, and that is where pain and the vicious cycle of pain uh, truly begins to have its impact on our brain. The overlap that I was referring to, um, there, there are a lot of parts of our brain. There are parts that uh, perceive sensations, um, and there are parts that uh, put an emotional component to that perception. And what we're learning from advanced uh, scans, fMRIs, uh, and other types of uh, imaging is that when one area is triggered for pain, almost the same area with, with minor uh, detractions is experienced from a depression and anxiety standpoint. Wow. Wow. So what we're trying to do psychotherapeutically and even using uh, psychotropic medication mm -hmm. um, is to treat both. Uh, because if you can treat depression and really help somebody begin to experience their pain differently, um, by and large, it would affect their pain in a favorable way. Very interesting. Wow. Very interesting. So, I mean, that, that right there brings up um, a few different questions for me. But, but one is, as you're talking about this idea of pain being present and then our kind of initial response is to, to pull away from it, um, and is it possible to kind of change your psychology around pain such that uh, when you experience pain, you don't necessarily pull away from it, but I don't want to say like you go towards it, but rather you just kind of keep on going. And, and, and my, my, my thought that kind of came to my head as you were speaking, I don't know if I'm articulating this well, but it's, it's something like extreme situations like the Navy SEALs, where they might be experiencing like immense physical discomfort, but they've kind of trained themselves to continue to cope with that and continue to push forward. So is it possible to kind of change that aspect of our brain where instead of reflexively pulling away, we're able to almost ignore that and kind of keep pushing forward. Yes. And that, that's a really good example. And, and the example I also, also give, um, our, our athletes, you know, they're out in the field and mm -hmm. they've injured themselves or in fact may have broken uh, a leg or an arm mm -hmm. and they continue to play. Mm -hmm. And so much of it depends on your perception of what that pain means. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when people go from acute pain, to chronic pain, that's that's a, a really delicate time for, for most of us mm -hmm. because when you go to the doctor and you have a backache, let's say, you expect that doctor to give you some kind of either exercise or medication to make that pain go away, and oftentimes it does. Yeah. And again, that's more acute pain. Um, the period between acute pain and a chronic pain, which again is a six-month period, um, I like to think of as subacute pain, and okay. that's when a sense of helplessness can begin to develop. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are trying to follow doc doctor's recommendations. Um, they're having uh, procedures done, or they're taking medications, and the pain isn't going away. Mm -hmm. And again, that's where that emotional suffering can begin. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do here is to get in front of that process uh, mm -hmm. for patients, to help them understand that while they may have pain for the rest of their lives, which mm -hmm. isn't something anyone ever wants to hear, sure. um, but they can live as fully as they possibly can if they don't overemphasize um, the fear aspect. You know, oh. What is this pain doing to me? Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so yes, um, there are so many different ways that we can help people, uh, people with that uh, by using um, distraction. Distraction is incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's been shown, as I was saying with some imaging, mm -hmm. um, that it shuts down a part of the brain that's perceiving the pain. Wow. Oh, interesting. Um, huh. You can use mindfulness training mm -hmm. where a person doesn't necessarily try to get rid of the train the pain rather uh, but accepts the pain as it is mm -hmm. um, and doesn't magnify it and make their lives worth worse as a result of it mm -hmm. interesting so almost, Very. it almost seems like you described the pain cycle which is probably where well it sounds like that's where all the a lot of the uh, like mental and emotional suffering comes from the helplessness feeling. It's like, geez, every time I try to do something that might help me, is it going to work? Or, you know, my back in the same boat, that kind of cyclic thing. So, so what you guys are doing is kind of constructing almost interruptions in that. Is that how we could think of it? Like, um, you know, changes in how you're perceiving it or changing the activity that you do when you experience something, the distraction piece. Um, what about a, I don't know if this is, relevant or is there a physical piece that goes along with it i mean you were mentioning for example like 
if your knee hurts and you want to, you know, get your knee better, so you're told to do knee exercises, but then it flares it up and now you're in the same boat. Has that been shown to be helpful at all? Or is it more of more like uh, the examples you gave that I think people more traditionally think of as in psychology with mindfulness or um, a distraction technique or a perception changes? No, I, and what you're addressing, addressing is so important, which is exercise. And I think that's the format of your, your mm-hmm. show. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, of, of course, if you have uh, broken your leg, you don't want to necessarily run out and exercise. Um, or if you just had uh, back surgery, you have to follow your doctor's advice. But, you know, the, the, the concept of bed rest, which is something that really uh, took shape and form many, many decades ago, is no longer uh, the go-to approach. Hmm. Um, the more we use our bodies appropriately and within somewhat's limits, um, the better we're going to be as, as a species. Yeah. So, um, finding certainly a good having a good understanding of what the pathology of your pain is sure um and then doing something within those constraints i think is is incredibly important now there are types of pain you know and and this isn't something that we address routinely here but malignant pain people who are struggling with cancer Mm -hmm. uh, people who have different types of pain because of a malignant condition um that is a separate category um that still does require uh, an emphasis on mobility um, and you know living as fully as a person can. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for those who have suffered an injury and it develops into chronic pain, exercise is definitely uh, a part of our program here. Very cool. Very cool. So you know, th- this might be a little bit out there, but um, <laughs> do you ever suggest or, or would it be maybe beneficial for uh, – just people in general to expose themselves to maybe some kind of mild form of discomfort on a regular basis so they can find so they can learn these coping mechanisms as almost a way of say if there there is more pain that actually comes and that that's actually threatening they're able to to cope with it better is that anything that you talk with people about from a just a, a overall kind of wellness perspective like hey maybe it's not the best idea that you're completely pain free all the time maybe you do some things that make yourself a little uncomfortable and, and this could be beneficial uh, are you speaking with people who are struggling with a form of chronic pain or people in general? Well, I was, I was thinking people in general, um, but it, so, all right. So I, I guess where this question is stemming from is, um, so I, I will take, uh, I will force myself to like take cold showers. Okay. And e- e- cold shower is like really uncomfortable. And while it's not necessarily painful, I do experience that response of like, oh my gosh, this is really uncomfortable. Let me stop it right away. Which I think is. Um, a, a fairly similar to response, say if, if somebody hurts themselves, it's like, oh my gosh, this is really uncomfortable. Let me do whatever I can to get out of it. But uh, over time, you know, taking the cold shower, I've kind of trained a little bit to kind of calm that response down. I'm just wondering if that that's something that you see might be beneficial across the board for people. So if there is a little, you know, uh, ache or something going on here or there, they're able to better respond to it as opposed to, um, as opposed to it being emotionally detrimental from the get go. Uh, you raise an interesting point. I think it goes beyond uh, physical pain. It, it isn't something that I routinely recommend for someone to mm-hmm. um, put themselves in some type of distress, be it physical or emotional. But mm-hmm. what I um, always encourage with patients is to have as many coping skills available to them mm. uh, to deal with life as it comes at them. Interesting. Uh, yeah. With a physical uh, condition, be it an emotional stressor, you know, for those of us who, let's say, work 70 or 80 hours um, a week, mm-hmm. we define ourselves by our vocation and we channel any amount of stress into our work. Mm-hmm. And what happens if that person loses his or her job or becomes ill and they can't work? Then they're sort of stuck mm-hmm. um, and they feel that they don't really have a way of coping. Mm-hmm. So I feel that there has to be fluidity um, in the way we manage stressors, again, being physical or otherwise. Mm-hmm. And the more I think the more we are exposed to life and to stressors, the better able we are um, to deal with things that come in the future. It's like building our immune system. You yeah. know, if we live in a bubble the moment we're born, by the time we're 15, we're not going to be exposed to anything to fight off something that comes our way. Right. I think the same concept holds true with that. Very cool. Very cool. Now, when we're talking about chronic pain, 
Um, I know you mentioned one big characteristic is 85%, you know, also struggle with depression. And we kind of talked about how that develops. But if someone's struggling with chronic pain, um, is it pretty apparent when, or are they, or is it kind of like, you know, like a hiding disease, like you wouldn't know unless you talk to them? Or are they pretty more withdrawn people? Or are they, you know, they might be someone I met this morning at a business meeting and I would never know unless I talk to them. Um, what are their characteristics? Or is that, is it too, are they too widespread to even give characteristics of? You're, you're raising such an important question. And, and the reason I think it's important is because you cannot eyeball the impression. There's no way you can eyeball depression. Yes, if you see somebody crying, and perhaps they've been crying for two weeks, mm -hmm. then you could probably assume they're struggling with a level of emotional despair. Um, but studies have been done repeatedly to show that uh, physicians, nurses, even psychologists cannot really accurately determine and reliably determine that somebody is struggling with clinical depression. The, only way to do that is using a validated uh, empirical measure. Hmm. Uh, we uh, here tend to use the patient health questionnaire nine, which is a nine um, item questionnaire. It takes a few minutes to administer. Um, and it not only serves to um, tell someone, a healthcare provider, that somebody might be dealing with depression, but it's based on uh, diagnostic uh, criteria that psychologists and psychiatrists use to diagnose depression. So we mm -hmm. can use that as a diagnostic tool as well. Sure. Hmm. Um, so what we do here is we don't make assumptions. Um, every patient that walks into our clinic from the physician's office to my office um, all complete a series of questionnaires uh, to figure out if they're struggling with something. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and I, and I ask slightly selfishly because I think in our practice, uh, we tend to specialize in working with individuals that are struggling to figure out this whole exercise thing, whether it be because they keep flaring up or they have a chronic illness and no one's giving exercise recommendations for chronic illness except physical therapy. And then when they graduate, they're like, ah, I don't know what to do. So it's interesting because I know I've talked to many people um, here at MAS that have told me about, you know, pain and issues they've had for uh, one woman, 18 years. And I'm like, what, 18 years? I get angry if I'm my back hurts for one week. I can't <laughs> believe you've handled that for 18 years. Um, what are some recommendations? Um, so, well, first question, this person or, you know, clients that are in these types of shoes that have clearly been experiencing pain for over six months, um, without a diagnosis, would they still be in the category of chronic pain? And then second question is, um, is there always the mental component that goes along with the pain aspect that is debilitating as we spoke about with that kind of cyclic type action that was happening that led to depression? Sure. I, so I'm sorry, what was your first question? The first one was if they if they haven't been diagnosed but are experiencing pain for over six months, is it still technically, would that be chronic pain or would you have to get diagnosed? Is that a diagnosis? Uh, well, I, I think you have, there, there's a chronic pain syndrome, but I, I think that that question really needs to be addressed with a physician. The very loose definition, um, chronic pain is pain that persists past the normal time of healing, uh, which by definition is usually dependent on the criteria three to six months. Um, and that could be the result of uh, medical disease, an injury, uh, scar tissue uh, with inflammation, uh, or an unknown cause. Um, so, I mean, you think about a person that uh, unfortunately loses a limb. Yeah. Um, there's the phenomenon of uh, phantom limb pain. Mm. And that is a chronic pain condition. And the source of the, uh, the injury is no longer there, but yet they continue to experience pain. Hmm. Um, but it's, you know, if someone is struggling with, uh, with pain, it's best to speak to a physician to find out, is there something ongoing that, you know, doesn't meet the eye? So mm. I hope that answers your first question. Yeah, yeah. Second question, um, does there necessarily have to be an emotional component? I'd say yes. And it's, you know, it's a part of our, our wiring. Mm -hmm. You know, we, the way we perceive things um, affects uh, how we um, experience it, right? So humans have a way of suffering in ways that many animals do not. I mean, if you see a dog that hurts his or her leg, you know, they'll go and, you know, lay down, have a bite to eat, but they don't usually suffer. You don't mm -hmm. see that, feel that as an observer. Um, we humans don't like to be uncomfortable, um, and we like things to get better quickly. Um, and 
unfortunately, pain conditions don't always get better quickly. And so helping patients find a way to not only take more responsibility uh, in the perception of their pain, uh, but do something about it a little bit differently is, is our goal. That's awesome. So talk a little bit more about that. What are some like common barriers that you might see when it comes to pain management? I know we talked about uh, depression a little bit, but what are there other kind of psychological factors or psychological influences that become a barrier to people, you know, getting through the pain that they're experiencing? Um, well, I think expectation. Mm. Uh, I think that is the, the number one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, when a patient comes in, let's say for back surgery, uh, one of the first questions I'll ask them is, "What are what are you hoping to get out of this surgery, and when are you hoping to feel as as good as you hope to feel?" Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, those expectations are hidden. They've never addressed that with their physician or their surgeon, so they go in expecting to feel better a week after surgery. When the the surgeon is thinking, "Oh, they'll be better in six months." Um, so once a disconnect has been repaired, um, most patients um, are at least able to adapt to the recovery period. Mm-hmm. So expectation is number one. Mm-hmm. Um, I think another thing is, um, you know, accountability. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times, and again, this is unique to our species, but we don't want to take responsibility for our own um, <laughs> recovery. You know, we want mm-hmm. the medication to do it. We want the doctor to do it. But when you tell someone, well, you have to start walking and it's going to hurt a little bit more before you feel better, there's an alarm in their face that they actually have to do something. Mm-hmm. and. I think that's the wonderful thing about our, our, our pro camp that we have is that patients are able to see results within the six week period that they're with us. Mm-hmm. And it's because they're doing something a little bit different um, to get themselves better. That's really cool. As you're working with a patient and um, I'm sure you're, you're trying to understand their situation and, you know, making suggestions and hearing how they're feeling about things. Um, are, are individuals that are experiencing chronic pain and potentially the depression that goes along with it and anxiety, um, what is this like in terms of their ability to participate or their their willingness to try new things? Is this like a high, like a very difficult for people to get out of this bubble or is it pretty like, whatever you say, I'm going to try it in tomorrow. I'm going to do everything you say and meditate and do all the things, you know. What is that like getting people to actually start like taking actions? Um, again, it really depends, I think, on the person, on their, their pain experience, um, and also, also their cohort, um, you know, how old they happen to be. Mm-hmm. Um, I think our job as, as providers, as health psychologists, is to do quite a bit of education um, at the start of our uh, treatment with them, because um, a lot of patients will say, what, you're telling me if I close my eyes and breathe deeply, I'm going to feel better? That's ridiculous. <laughs> right. And once they actually do it and learn how to, to use that um, distraction to serve them, they begin to feel the effects of um, the work that they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, something unique to um, something we offer here in the office is biofeedback. Mm. Um, and both of my colleagues offer biofeedback services. And biofeedback a person's actually watching on a computer screen the effects um, of the practice that they're doing, either breathing uh, or relaxation therapy, and they can actually see their heart rate go down or their oxygenation improve. And it's really a wonderful tool for some patients who need immediate, um, some kind of immediate response from their efforts. Sure. Um, But education is the key, I think, because if you don't have that, then someone's going to think it's hocus pocus and... No one wants to participate in something that's not evidence-based. That's true. Right. right. That well, is true. Lucky for you. I mean, we Charlie and I always say this. Lucky for us, fitness is widely known as being healthy for you. Mm-hmm. And I think one cool thing is that I think meditation and mindfulness and breathing is kind of becoming more heard of. It's not as like hokey pokey as I think it once was, like five to ten years ago. So I think that's really cool and definitely works in everyone's favor um, in terms of starting to participate in taking care of our mental health. Absolutely. Now, um, one thing I'm curious about is 
When you find patients that come in and they're in pain and they historically have been relatively active, do you find that for them it's more about they want to get back to the activity or they actually will be able to be happy even if they're still in pain but are able to get back to activity? Or I guess I said, I said the same thing. So is it is it more that they want to flat out get rid of their pain or do you find that most people just want to be able to get back to doing the things that, that they enjoy doing and if they have to you know cope through some pain but they're still able to do the activities they end up you know all right do you see it one way or another with people or majority yeah I, I think that's it, it really depends on the person of course mm-hmm. um, you know people who um, have historically found ways of taking care of themselves physically mm-hmm. taking care of themselves emotionally and certainly taking care of themselves cognitive behaviorally, um, I think are more, more open to challenging themselves to move forward um, and not over rely on others uh, to help them reduce their pain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, I think the idea of who they were um, can often get in the way. It may mm-hmm. serve as a motivator, mm-hmm. um, but I've often found that when patients aren't able to get back to, uh, I don't know, running the marathon or um, exercise in the way they had, they feel disappointed. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, one of the first things that we do when we work with people is to ask them what their goal is, you know, in getting better. And, and if that means um, having them run a few blocks, are they physically capable of doing that? Mm-hmm. If the answer is yes, then we help them do that. And then they're more, more motivated to do that if it's realistic. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Dr. Costas, talk to us about the uh, the camp that you all run for uh, patients, you know, as they're kind of coping with pain and, and working through uh, the pain symptoms that they're having. Sure. That's a good question. So ProCamp um, is, is something that we developed here. Uh, Dr. Ankur Dave, um, who is the medical director of uh, pain service here, mm-hmm. and I and my colleagues um, developed uh, ProCamp, which again uh, stands for uh, the Pain Rehabilitation Outpatient Camp, or mm-hmm. ProCamp. Uh, so it's a six-week uh, multidisciplinary uh, program. Our patients meet with us two days a week for six weeks um, and average between two to three hours a day, uh, uh, twice a week. Um, during those six weeks, uh, they meet with uh, one of the health psychologists, be it me or Dr. Lena Liu or Dr. Susan Lusher. They'll also meet with our exercise physiologist, Um at the uh, outpatient center, and they'll also meet with a nutritionist um, and a yoga instructor. Awesome. So our goal is to really provide, again, a multidisciplinary approach um, that is educational in, in nature, uh, but really gets people moving. Um, during the exercise class, they start with basic stretching, they move to uh, more movement therapy, um, and then sometimes weights or some resistance training um, to have them understand that simply moving an exercise is not going to make their pain worse. They may feel the pain more acutely while they're doing it, but afterward they're going to build the stamina to get better. What we do um, as health psychologists, not only um, educate them uh, about the role that their psychology plays in their understanding of their pain, uh, but also help them think about their pain differently um, from a cognitive behavioral standpoint, um, teaching them better communication skills, uh, relaxation therapy um, and things of the sort. Very neat. Where is this camp done? Is it at the hospital or do they have different locations they go to? Right now uh, we're offering it at our St. Alexis uh, Medical Center Outpatient Rehabilitation Center on Gulf Road. Great. Um, so that's the one location that we're doing that right now. That's awesome. 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 And then what are the requirements for people to participate in that? Um, there are some very specific criteria. So they would have to meet uh, with uh, our physician's assistant or nurse practitioner, um, fill out a few forms. If it's indicated to meet with Dr. Dave, um, they would definitely have to meet with one of us. Uh, we want to make sure when someone comes in to ProCamp that they are optimized. Um, from my perspective, we want to make sure that they're not struggling with a level of depression that's going to get in the way of their ability to participate or show up. Uh, we want to make sure that they understand what their pain is about, that they are actually able to participate in light exercise uh, and movement therapy. Mm-hmm. So we don't want to set somebody up to fail, uh, but we will get someone, if they're a candidate, we will get somebody ready and optimized for it if they're not ready once they walk through our door. Awesome. Well, Dr. Costas, 
tell us a little bit about the things that you do uh, within your own daily life to kind of promote your own health and well-being. Yeah, um, I, I think about that quite a bit because I, I tend to be a pretty anxious guy, mm-hmm. um, and I've always been that way. And anyone who knows me knows that I run a little bit high on the anxiety scale, and sometimes that works for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I get a lot of stuff done in a short mm-hmm. amount of time, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, and I learned in graduate school the one thing that really works for me is running. Mm-hmm. Um, I awesome. I run as much as I can, um, mm-hmm. or not as much as I can, but as many times. Um, a week that I possibly can, at least during uh, the summer or warmer months. Mm-hmm. Um, I also bike. So physically uh, relieving some of that built-up stress during the day uh, is primary for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I also think it's really important for me to get um, a little bit of quiet time um, to myself without any animals or people around me mm-hmm. um, just to kind of decompress from the day um, and get in a good night's sleep. So That's I think... Awesome. Those three things are really key to, to my functioning. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's awesome. I love that. You know, there's there's a book that I read maybe a few months back, a really good book. It's called Spark, and it talks about uh, how exercise affects the brain. And one of the uh, things that they talked about was, you know, anxiety, depression, things like that. And, you know, they, they strongly recommended, like you're saying, running, you know, if you find that maybe you are a little bit more anxious or things like this. So that's, that's awesome that you found that for yourself and they you find it to work um, because the the literature and clearly practical experience you know supports it so that's really cool yeah yeah really i love it wonderful wonderful now what would some things be that you recommend our listeners do to kind of help you you said hey the more ways you can learn how to cope with pain or cope with discomfort in your life um you know are there maybe like three or so things that you'd recommend or that you do recommend to your patients that our listeners could start incorporating to help kind of build up their their coping reservoirs yeah sure and and we can limit it to three but i think the one thing kind of going back to what i was saying earlier is have as many coping skills available to you as you possibly can healthy Mm -hmm. coping skills Mm -hmm. um because if you limit yourself to one or two uh, you may you may find yourself uh, unable to access them when you really need them. Mm-hmm. Um, so to make sure your toolbox is as full as possible. Um, that being said, I think exercising regularly, and that could be something you know as simple as taking the stairs and t- instead of taking the elevator uh, yeah. when you get to work, if you can do that, mm-hmm. um, or go for a walk after dinner. Um, do something with your body, mm-hmm. you know, 20, 30 minutes a day, um, just to move. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Because the more sedate we are, the worse it is for our minds and certainly the worse it is for our bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, I also think it's important to practice a form of relaxation therapy, and that can be anything from meditation uh, to progressive muscle relaxation, mm-hmm. mindfulness training. There's no one right way of doing that. Um, mm-hmm. But a book that I, I still hold true is The Relaxation Response, uh, written by Herbert Benson. And he argues that um, as long as four key elements um, are achieved, um, and that includes quiet environment, a number of things, um, you will reach uh, the relaxation response, which is good for your body. So it's awesome. doing that. Um, and then find something to laugh at every day. Mm, Not I someone. Like yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> Some humor in life. Because um, life is short. Uh, and there's enough uh, chaos in the world right now that we need to find ways to make ourselves feel good emotionally. So, I like that. Yeah. Those yeah. would be my my three from a bucket list. Love that. It's uh, it's interesting you brought up, um, you know, find, uh, I forget how you said it, find find coping mechanisms that are healthy, or so, you said something like that, and uh, it made, it was an interesting point you said because one time I was speaking to my friend who's a, um, a mental health therapist, and I said. Well, don't you think it's just as good to like eat chocolate to feel better rather than to meditate? And she goes, that's interesting because people get addicted to stuff to to cope with things like eating chocolate or, you know, watching inappropriate things on the computer or, you know, whatever they're addicted to. And she sent me this article, which I could tell you zero factual information pieces from it. But what it was doing was highlighting that um, if meditation or mindfulness or you know, relaxation techniques becomes almost like your addiction or the thing that you routinely go back to. It actually yeah. had beneficial aspects to the brain versus other mm. things that you might return to, like eating chocolate or um, 
I don't know if you're like overly addicted to running and you're going into chronic fatigue or unhealthy thing, you know, anything like that actually has negative effects on the brain. So I just thought that was interesting and maybe I'll pull that back out and we'll talk about it in some other podcast and I'll have the <laughs> details. But I love that she sent that to me because I was like, oh, so not all mechanisms of distraction or coping are equal. And that was the first time it was highlighted to me. You know, I, 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 this may not be the time or place for this, but I think that research is, is spot on, and I'm glad you brought that up, because the hypothalamus um, is what activates the relaxation response. Mm -hmm. But the hypothalamus is what also activates the fight-or-flight response. Hmm. So if people are chronically stressed because of the fight-or-flight response, long-term use of meditation or relaxation therapies will actually change um, the output of the hypothalamus to keep you at a lower base rate of anxiety and stress. So if you find something stressful, you're not going to react as um, anxiously as you might have had you not practiced the, the relaxation exercises. Yeah. Interesting. Very and I love cool. all the new stuff coming out about that because I think um, myself included, you know, when you first hear about meditation or relaxation techniques, you think just what you said, Dr. Costas was, you know, uh, I'm just going to sit here and breathe and that's like what you want me to do. Like that's going to get me better. But then seeing the physical changes in the brain that um, I think research is now coming out about um, is really fascinating. And it's, and it's quite crazy that you literally can sit and practice you know, being mindful and breathing and that can ch make physical changes, which is crazy to me and really <laughs> fascinating. So maybe some other podcast will have you back on and you can tell us all about that. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Well, Dr. Kosas, how can our listeners get in contact with you? If, they, if they're hearing this and they're like, you know what, I've been struggling with some chronic pain and I need to see kind of what, you know, emotional barriers or psychological things are contributing to this or preventing me from being pain free. How can people connect with you? Um, they can call um, our, our appointment line um, awesome. and schedule an appointment with me. Uh, that number is 847-981-3630. Fantastic. Um, or if they have questions and they're not quite sure if they want to make an appointment, um, they can be transferred back to my private line, and I'm happy to call people back. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Dr. Kosas, the question that we always like to have all of our guests kind of wrap up with is, what is your definition of health? That's a really good question. I think, you know, beyond the measures uh, that define health when you go to your doctor for your an annual checkup, um, I think having a, a sense of purpose in life uh, that gives us something to look forward to every day that you wake up, um, I think that is the meaning of quality of life. It's uh, beautiful. And I think when we withdraw from life for whatever reason, be it depression, be it chronic pain, we rob ourselves of the, the importance of finding something to do with our time. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Love I love that, that response. Yeah. You know what? That was the first time we've heard that uh, as a response from one of our, all of our numbers of brilliant guests. But, you know, it's interesting is, have you heard of the blue zones? Like the places where people live and they're called blue zones? No, I've not. Yeah, so there are areas of the world that researchers have identified that these individuals live uh, significantly longer than other individuals. And so, of course, it's now become a marketing thing. And my parents that live in Naples, Florida, um, were like, oh, Naples is becoming a Blue Zone certified, you know, city. And I was like, what? Like, how can you decide to be in a Blue Zone? But anyways, they've tried to study these areas. I think there's a couple areas in Japan and, you know, some different islands. And they're trying to study what the practices are of these individuals that are living so long. And one of the things that surprised me was um, they have a purpose. And there was like nine things. And one of those things was yeah, they woke up every morning with a purpose. And so that's cool that you brought that up. And uh, it's a response I hadn't yet heard except for in the Blue Zone certified areas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I didn't know that, so I'm going to look at that. Yeah, yeah. very neat. Well, Dr. Kostas, thank you so much for joining us. We just so greatly appreciate your expertise. This was just a, a fascinating conversation. So thank you for sharing your time with us. Well, thank you for having me, guys. Absolutely, absolutely. And for our listeners, who do you know that needs to hear this information? Share this episode with them so they can hear all the amazing things that Dr. Kostas covered with us today. If you wouldn't mind, head on over to iTunes and click subscribe and leave us a rating and review. So next week, when we have a brand new exercise-based episode coming out, that gets immediately downloaded to your listening platform of choice. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. We always appreciate it. Have a fantastic week, and we'll talk with you all 
next week. <laughs>